I always thought bad news came on rainy days or in the middle of the night. Instead, it arrived on a perfect Tuesday morning in October, right after I closed a major account that would probably earn me partner by the end of the year. My name is Callie, and this is the story of how I lost everything and found myself in the process. Mrs. Monroe, could you come back in? Dr. Chen's voice carried none of the warmth from our usual checkups. I'd known her for years. She'd helped me through migraines and stress-related insomnia as my career took off. But this was different. I smoothed my skirt and followed her back into the examination room, my heels clicking against the linoleum floor. The sound echoed in my ears, somehow louder than usual. The blood work showed some concerning markers, she said, pulling up images on her computer. And the follow-up tests confirmed what we suspected. My phone buzzed in my purse, probably Gavin, asking about dinner plans. We were supposed to celebrate my win tonight at that new French place downtown. I let it go to voicemail. It's cancer, isn't it? The words came out steady, surprising even me. Dr. Chin nodded, her face softening. Stage two breast cancer. But Callie, we caught it relatively early. The prognosis is good with immediate treatment. The rest of the conversation became a blur of statistics and treatment options. I nodded at appropriate intervals, took the referrals she handed me, and somehow managed to walk out of her office without falling apart. In my car, I sat staring at my phone. Three missed calls from Gavin. I should call him back, tell him everything. Instead, I found myself dialing Tessa. You've reached the fabulous Tessa Caldwell. Leave a message. I hung up without speaking. What would I even say? Hey, best friend, guess who just joined the cancer club? My phone lit up again. Gavin. Hey, babe, his voice came through, distracted as usual. We still on for tonight? I invited Marcus to join us. Hope that's okay. He's had a rough week. Marriage troubles again. I watched a couple walk past my car, holding hands and laughing about something. They looked so normal, so unaware that someone's world was imploding 20 feet away from them. Callie, you there? Yeah, I managed. About tonight. I'm not feeling great. Maybe we should reschedule. Seriously? Come on, you've been talking about this celebration for weeks. Marcus already changed his plans to join us. Something in his tone made me pause. The slight edge of annoyance, the way he emphasized Marcus's accommodation rather than asking if I was okay. I just got some bad news, I said carefully. I really need to talk to you, alone. Bad news? What happened? Did the Peterson account fall through? No, the account's fine. It's, it's about my health. Can you come home early? The silence on the other end stretched just a beat too long. Yeah, sure. I'll cancel with Marcus. But you're sure you're okay? Nothing's serious. I watched another couple walk by, this time an elderly pair. The man held his partner's arm, guiding her carefully around a crack in the sidewalk. I don't know yet. I lied. We'll talk at home. After hanging up, I sat there for another 15 minutes, watching people pass by. Each of them carrying their own stories, their own secrets, their own fears. I wondered how many had sat in their cars just like this, trying to figure out how to tell their spouse that everything was about to change. Finally, I started the engine. As I pulled out of the parking lot, I caught a glimpse of myself in the rearview mirror. I looked exactly the same as I had this morning, same carefully applied makeup, same professional smile. But something had shifted, like a photograph slightly out of focus. The woman looking back at me wasn't quite the same person who had walked into Dr. Chen's office an hour ago. I had no idea then that the cancer would turn out to be the least of my problems. I'd always thought Gavin and I were good at talking through problems. That night proved me wrong. He came home late, take out bags in hand instead of the French cuisine we'd planned on. The smell of greasy Chinese food turned my stomach. I got your favorite, he said, setting the bags on our granite counter. Sweet and sour chicken, extra sauce. I stood in our kitchen, still in my work clothes, the doctor's referral papers burning a hole in my purse. I'm not really hungry. Come on, you need to eat. Whatever's wrong, we can figure it out. He started unpacking containers, not looking at me. The Peterson account is solid. If something else went wrong at work. I have cancer, Gavin. 
The container of rice slipped from his hands, spilling across the counter. Neither of us moved to clean it up. What? He finally turned to face me. That's, that's not possible. You're too young. I laughed, a hollow sound that surprised us both. Apparently not. He ran his hands through his hair, a nervous habit I used to find endearing. Now it just reminded me of how he dodged my calls all afternoon. What's the treatment plan? How much will this cost? Does your insurance? Really? That's your first question? The words came out sharper than I intended. Not are you okay? Or how are you feeling? I'm trying to be practical here, he said, his voice rising slightly. Someone has to think about the logistics. The distance between us felt wider than the kitchen island separating us. I watched him fidget with his wedding ring, twisting it around his finger. Dr. Chin referred me to an oncologist. I said, pulling out the papers. I have an appointment next week. Stage two breast cancer. They caught it early. Gavin nodded, but his eyes kept darting to his phone on the counter. It buzzed with an incoming text. He reached for it automatically. Don't, I said quietly. Please, just be here with me for five minutes. He pulled his hand back like the phone had burned him. Sorry. Force of habit. Marcus has been dealing with some stuff at work and I don't care about Marcus. The force of my own voice startled me. I'm your wife and I just told you I have cancer. Can you please just hold me? Tell me we'll get through this. He came around the island then, wrapping his arms around me but something fell off. His embrace was stiff, mechanical, like he was following a script for a supportive husband, but couldn't quite remember his lines. We'll figure this out, he said into my hair. I promise. His phone buzzed again. And again. This time, he pulled away to check it. Marcus is having a crisis, he said, already typing a response. His wife found some messages on his phone and he needs to talk to his best friend right now, when your wife just told you she has cancer. I stepped back, suddenly cold despite the warm kitchen. Go ahead. He clearly needs you more than I do. Kelly, don't be like that. You know I'm here for you, but I can't just ignore my friends when they need help. Like you ignore my calls all afternoon? He had the decency to look guilty. I was in meetings, important ones. You know how it is. I did know. I'd been in plenty of important meetings myself, but I'd always stepped out for his calls, always put him first. When had that stopped being mutual? Go, I said, turning away to gather the scattered rice. Go help Marcus with his marriage crisis. I'll be fine here, planning my cancer treatment alone. You're not alone, he protested, but he was already grabbing his keys. We'll talk more tomorrow, okay? When things are calmer? I didn't answer. The front door closed behind him with a soft click that felt oddly final. Standing in our pristine kitchen, surrounded by spilled rice and cooling takeout, I realized something that should have been obvious long before my diagnosis. My marriage was already sick. The cancer had just exposed the symptoms. I pulled out my phone and dialed Tess's number again. This time, when it went to voicemail, I left a message. Hey, it's me. I need you. Everything's falling apart, and I don't think Gavin's going to be here to help pick up the pieces. Tessa showed up at my first chemotherapy session with two cups of ginger tea and a look I knew too well, the one that meant she had something to say that I wouldn't want to hear. He didn't come with you? She settled into the chair beside my treatment recliner, scanning the room as if Gavin might be hiding behind one of the privacy curtains. Working, I said, adjusting the foreline in my arm. Big presentation today. Right. Because those are so much more important than your first chemo session. She handed me one of the teas. Have you noticed anything odd lately? I took a sip, grateful for the warm liquid against the metallic taste already forming in my mouth. You mean besides my husband becoming a ghost in our marriage? Marcus's wife left him last week, Tessa said carefully, watching my face. Apparently, he's been staying at a friend's place. I know. Gavin mentioned it. The tea suddenly felt too hot in my hands. What aren't you telling me? A nurse passed by, checking my vitals. I forced a smile, 
pretending this was just another casual conversation between friends. Sarah, you know, from accounting? She saw Gavin and Marcus at Riverside Cafe yesterday. Tessa paused, her fingers tightening around her cup. They weren't alone. It was probably a business lunch, I said, but my voice sounded hollow even to me. There was a woman with them. Young, blonde. Sarah said she seemed familiar with them both. Tessa leaned closer. And she was wearing your favorite scarf. The blue Hermes one Gavin gave you for your anniversary. The room tilted slightly. I remembered searching for that scarf last week, assuming I'd left it at the office. That doesn't mean anything, I said, but memories started clicking into place like puzzle pieces I'd been avoiding. The late nights. The mysterious text messages. The way Gavin had been so invested in Marcus's marriage problems. Callie. Tessa's voice softened. You know I wouldn't say this if I wasn't sure. Sarah took pictures. Show me. She pulled out her phone, hesitating. Maybe we should wait until after your treatment. Show me now. The photos were clear despite being taken from a distance. Gavin and Marcus at an outdoor table, laughing with a woman I'd never seen before. She was wearing my scarf. And in the last photo, Gavin's hand rested on hers, their fingers intertwined. I'm going to be sick, I said, and Tessa barely got the basin under my chin in time. The nurse rushed over, assuming it was the chemo, but I knew better. This nausea came from watching my life unravel in three simple photographs. Do you want me to call someone? The nurse asked, wiping my face with a cool cloth. Your husband, maybe? I almost laughed. No. No, I don't want my husband. After the nurse left, Tessa took my hand. What are you going to do? I looked around the treatment room. Other patients sat in their recliners, some alone, some with loved ones who actually showed up. An elderly man across the room was reading aloud to his wife, making her laugh despite the chemicals flowing into her veins. First, I'm going to finish this treatment, I said, straightening in my chair. Then I'm going to go home and check our bank statements, phone records, everything. And then, and then, my phone buzzed with a text from Gavin. Sorry I couldn't make it today. Dinner tonight? Marcus wants to introduce us to someone. The audacity of it hit me like a physical blow. He wasn't even trying to hide it anymore. And then, I said, typing a response with steady fingers, I'm going to make him wish he'd never given that scarf to anyone else. Tessa squeezed my hand. Whatever you need, I'm here. I know. I pressed send on my reply. Can't wait to meet her. The chemicals continued dripping into my veins, but they weren't the most toxic thing in my life anymore. That honor belonged to the realization that while I was fighting for my life, my husband was planning his exit strategy. Well, two could play that game. The first thing I noticed when I came home early from chemo was the perfume. Not mine, something floral and heavy that clung to the air like a warning. My head was already spinning from the treatment, but this made my stomach lurch for entirely different reasons. I found her jacket draped over our couch. Designer, expensive, with a business card in the pocket for Claire Bennett, financial advisor. The same name I'd found repeating in our phone records, in credit card statements for restaurants I'd never visited. Moving through our house felt like walking through a crime scene, collecting evidence of my own murder. A wine glass with lipstick on the rim. A pair of heels by the stairs, smaller than mine. A phone charger that wasn't ours plugged into the kitchen outlet. I was taking pictures of everything when I heard Gavin's key in a lock. He wasn't alone. Just let me grab some files. His voice carried from the entryway. Then we can head back to the office. Your house is gorgeous, a woman replied. The realtor wasn't exaggerating. I stepped into the hallway, still holding my phone. Gavin froze. The blonde woman behind him, wearing my scarf, of course, had the decency to look embarrassed. Callie, Gavin said, recovering quickly. You're home early. I thought you'd be at treatment all afternoon. Clearly. I looked at the woman. You must be Claire. I love your perfume. It really fills a room. She glanced at Gavin, who had gone pale. I should go. No, please stay. I leaned against the wall, suddenly grateful for it holding me up. I'd love to hear more about these realtor discussions I apparently wasn't part of. This isn't how I wanted you to find out, 
Gavin said, stepping forward. With everything you're going through, you thought adding homelessness to my cancer diagnosis might be too much? Claire backed toward the door. I'll wait in the car. Good idea, I said, not looking at her. Though you forgot your jacket. And your shoes. And whatever else you've left here while I was fighting for my life. After she fled, Gavin and I stood in silence. I could hear the neighbor's kids playing outside, their laughter a surreal backdrop to this moment. I can explain, he started. Can you explain the realtor? My voice was steadier than I felt. Because that suggests this isn't just an affair. That suggests you've been planning this. He ran his hands through his hair, that familiar gesture I used to love. I've been thinking about this for a while. Before your diagnosis. The cancer just uh, complicated things. Complicated your exit strategy, you mean? That's not fair. Fair. The laugh that escaped me sounded foreign. You want to talk about fair? I'm fighting cancer, Gavin. I'm poisoning my body to stay alive while you're house hunting with your girlfriend. She's not. It's not that simple. He moved toward his office. Look, we can discuss this later. I have a meeting. With Marcus? I pulled out my phone, showing him the photos Tessa had sent. Is that why he's been so helpful lately? Covering for you. He stopped. You've been spying on me? And you've been betraying me. I guess we're both full of surprises. I pushed off the wall, walking to the stairs. Don't worry about coming back later. I'll have a lawyer contact you tomorrow. Callie, wait. Oh, and Claire? I called out, knowing she could hear through the open door. The scarf looks better on me, but you can keep it. I'd hate for you to start your new life together without a reminder of the woman you replaced. I made it upstairs before my legs gave out. Sitting on our bed, my bed now, I heard them leave, heard Claire's voice asking questions I couldn't make out. Gavin's responses were muffled, but his tone was defensive. Always the victim, even when he was the villain. My phone buzzed. A text from Tessa. Do you need me? I looked around the room, at the life Gavin and I had built. The photos on the wall, the shared closet, the memories that now felt like elaborate props in a play that had just ended. Yes, I typed back. And bring boxes. It's time to start packing. I had two battles to fight now. Cancer might kill me, but I'd be damned if I let Gavin's betrayal destroy me first. The oncology ward was quiet when I arrived for my third treatment, except for the steady beeping of monitors and the soft footsteps of nurses. I'd chosen the earliest appointment possible, hoping to avoid the pitying looks from other patients' families. Being alone was better than being reminded of what I'd lost. You're early, Mrs. Monroe, a male nurse said, checking my chart. His name tag read Ethan. We weren't expecting you for another hour. Couldn't sleep. I did mention that I'd spent the night sorting through divorce paperwork in my new apartment. And it's just Callie now. He nodded, starting my four with practice deficiency. Sometimes the quiet hours are the best ones. Less chaos. Less everything. I agreed, watching the clear liquid drip into my veins. Though I wouldn't mind some chaos right now. Might distract from. I gestured vaguely at everything. The four, the sterile room. My reflection in the window showing hair that was already starting to thin. Careful what you wish for, Ethan said, just as my phone lit up with an incoming call. My mother's name flashed on the screen. Speaking of chaos, I muttered, declining the call. It immediately rang again. Persistent chaos, Ethan observed, adjusting my drip rate. I sighed and answered. Mom, I'm in treatment. Why didn't you tell us? Her voice cracked. We had to hear from Margaret at church that Gavin's engaged? To some financial advisor? The room tilted slightly. Ethan must have noticed something in my face because he quickly brought over a basin, but I waved it away. That's, that's not possible, I said. We're not even divorced yet. Well, tell that to Claire's Instagram. The ring is bigger than the one he gave you. My fingers found the empty space on my left hand where my wedding ring used to be. I'd pawned it last week to pay for the apartment deposit. Mom, I need to go. Your father wants to talk to him, man to man. No, I said sharply. No one is talking to anyone. 
I'm handling this. But, sweetheart, I have to go. The nurse needs to check something. I hung up, hands shaking. Ethan pretended to be busy with my chart, giving me a moment to compose myself. Finally, he said, you know, I've noticed something about cancer patients. What's that? The ones who try to handle everything alone? They're usually the strongest ones. But they're also the ones who crash the hardest. I looked up at him, ready to defend myself, but there was no judgment in his eyes. Just understanding, and something else I couldn't quite name. Speaking from experience? I asked. He rolled up his sleeve, revealing a faint scar. Lymphoma, five years ago. My wife left three months into treatment, said she couldn't handle watching me die. What happened? I lived. He smiled slightly, just to spite her. Despite everything, I laughed. It felt foreign in my throat, but good. Mrs. Mon, sorry, Callie, he corrected himself. Sometimes the best revenge isn't getting even. It's getting better. My phone buzzed again, a text this time, from Tessa with a screenshot of Claire's Instagram post. The ring was enormous, ostentatious. Everything I wasn't. Better, I repeated, staring at the image. What if I want both? Ethan checked my 4-1 last time. Then maybe you need a better plan than handling it alone. I looked up at him, really looked at him for the first time. He was younger than I'd initially thought, with kind eyes and steady hands that had probably seen more battles than mine. Got any suggestions? Actually, he said, pulling out a business card, there's a support group that meets here on Thursdays. Not just for cancer patients, for anyone whose life has been blown up and needs help rebuilding. No pressure, but... I took the card, turning it over in my hands. On the back, he'd written his personal number. Just in case you decide chaos is overrated, he said quietly, before moving on to his next patient. I watched him go, then looked back at my phone. Claire's perfectly manicured hand sparkled up at me, wearing a ring bought with money that was partially mine. Getting better. Getting even. Maybe I could do both. I had planned on attending Linda and Harold's 40th anniversary party. But when I learned Gavin and Claire would be there, something inside me snapped. Maybe it was the chemo making me reckless, or maybe I was just tired of hiding. My hair had started falling out in clumps that morning. Instead of crying, I'd called my stylist and had her shave it all off. Now, standing in my former in-law's backyard in a dress that hung too loose on my frame, I felt everyone's eyes on my bare head. You came, Linda whispered, hugging me carefully. We weren't sure. I wouldn't miss it, I said, watching Gavin's face across the yard as he registered my presence. Claire clutched his arm, her ring catching the afternoon sun. Some things are worth fighting for. The party continued around us like a surreal play. People making small talk, avoiding the obvious drama unfolding. I moved through the crowd, accepting hugs and deflecting questions about my health, my divorce, my life. You shouldn't be here, Gavin said, finally approaching me by the drinks table. This is inappropriate. Inappropriate. I poured myself a ginger ale, proud that my hands didn't shake. Like proposing to your mistress before your divorce is final? Keep your voice down. He glanced around nervously. This isn't the time or place. When is the time, Gavin? When I'm dead. Is that what you're waiting for? The conversation around us stuttered to a halt. Claire appeared at his elbow, trying to pull him away. That's not fair, he said, but his eyes wouldn't meet mine. You know that's not. Fair. The word tasted bitter. Was it fair when you were house hunting with her while I was getting pumped full of poison? Was it fair when you used our joint accounts to buy that ring? I earned that money too, he snapped. I spent years living in your shadow, watching you climb the corporate ladder while I... While you what? Planned your escape? Built your backup life? Callie. Linda appeared beside me, her face tight with concern. Maybe we should go inside. No. I straightened my spine, feeling dizzy, but refusing to show it. I want everyone to hear this. I want them to know exactly who they're celebrating with. The yard had gone completely silent. Even the birds seemed to be holding their breath. You want to talk about fairness, Gavin? Okay. 
Let's talk about how you waited until I was literally fighting for my life to show your true colors. Let's talk about how you're playing happy families with Claire while I'm selling my jewelry to pay for treatments. That's enough, he growled, but I saw something crack in his expression. You're right, it is enough. I set down my glass, suddenly exhausted. I'm done being the victim in your story. I'm done being the inconvenient wife you had to escape from. I turned to leave, but my legs betrayed me. The world tilted, and I felt myself falling. Strong arms caught me, not Gavin's but Harold's. I've got you, sweetheart, my former father-in-law said, his voice thick with emotion. As he helped me to a chair, I heard Claire's voice. This is exactly why he left. She's always been so dramatic. The sound of a slap cut through the air. I looked up to see Linda standing over Claire, her hand still raised. Get out of my house, Linda said quietly. Both of you. Mom, Gavin started. Don't you dare call me that. Not after what you've done. I watched through blurring vision as Gavin and Claire left, the party dissolving into shocked whispers and hurried goodbyes. My victory felt hollow, tasting of ash and chemotherapy. I shouldn't have come, I whispered to Harold, still holding my arm. I've ruined everything. No, child, he said, his weathered hand covering mine. Sometimes things need to break completely before they can heal properly. But sitting there, too weak to stand, watching my former life crumble around me, I wondered if there was anything left worth healing. The cancer was spreading despite treatment, my career was on indefinite hold, and now I'd lost the only family I'd had for the past decade. Rock bottom, I realized, wasn't a place. It was a state of mind, and I was falling deeper by the second. The oncology ward's waiting room wasn't where I expected to have my final showdown with Gavin, but life has a way of choosing its own battlegrounds. I was filling out paperwork for my latest round of treatment when he walked in, looking as lost as I'd felt three months ago. Marcus told me, he said, hovering by the chair next to me, about his wife, about everything. I kept writing, focusing on the steady motion of pen across paper. Congratulations on finally catching up to what everyone else already knew. Can I sit? It's a free country, unlike marriage, apparently. He sat, running his hands through his hair, that familiar gesture that used to mean something different. Claire left. She's been seeing Marcus for months. The whole time, she was. Karma's a funny thing, isn't it? I signed the last form with more force than necessary. Is that why you're here? Looking for sympathy? I'm here because I was wrong. His voice cracked. About everything. Before I could respond, Ethan appeared with my chart. He assessed the situation with one quick glance. Everything okay here, Callie? I nodded, grateful for his presence. Just finishing up the paperwork. Good news on your latest scan, Ethan said, pointedly ignoring Gavin. The tumor's shrinking. Treatment's working. Unlike your engagement, I couldn't help adding. Gavin flinched. I deserve that. I deserve all of it. But Callie, if you'd just let me explain. Explain what? The words burst out of me. How you abandoned me when I needed you most. How you took our life savings to build a future with someone who was playing you just like you played me. I was scared, he whispered. Watching you get sick, seeing you so strong even when you were falling apart. It reminded me of how weak I am. How I've always been the one holding you back. That's not an excuse. No, it's not. He pulled out an envelope. That's why I brought this. The house sale went through. I'm signing over my half to you and I've already transferred back everything I took from our accounts, plus interest. I stared at the envelope, remembering all the nights I'd laid awake planning my revenge. Now here it was, served up on a silver platter, and it felt empty. Keep it, I said. What? I said keep it. I stood up, suddenly feeling stronger than I had in months. I don't want your guilt money, Gavin. I don't want anything from you anymore. But... The funny thing about cancer? I continued gathering my things. It shows you what's worth fighting for. And you? You're not worth the energy it would take to hate you. Ethan stepped forward. Your treatment room's ready. Thanks. I turned back to Gavin one last time. You know what real strength is? 
It's not running away when things get hard. It's not choosing the easy path because you're afraid of your own inadequacies. It's staying. It's fighting. It's loving someone enough to face your fears instead of making them face everything alone. I know that now, he said quietly. But it's too late, isn't it? Yeah, I nodded. It is. As I walked away with Ethan, Gavin called out, Are you going to be okay? I looked back at him. This man I'd once built my life around, now looking small and lost in the sterile waiting room. I already am okay, I said. That's what you never understood. I was always okay on my own. I just chose to be with you. And now I'm choosing something else. Ethan's hand brushed mine as we walked toward the treatment room, a gentle reminder that I wasn't actually alone. That choosing myself didn't mean choosing solitude. Ready for round five? He asked. I thought about Gavin sitting in that waiting room, finally understanding what he'd thrown away. About Claire and Marcus, whose karma had caught up with them. About all the nights I'd spent plotting revenge when I could have been focusing on healing. Yeah, I said, squeezing Ethan's hand. I'm ready for whatever comes next. One year later, I stood at the podium of the Cancer Center's annual fundraiser, my hair finally long enough to style. The crowd before me included familiar faces, Tessa in the front row, my former in-laws near the middle, and Ethan standing by the exit in his scrubs, having just finished his shift. When I was diagnosed, I began. I thought cancer would be the hardest battle I'd face. I was wrong. The hardest battle wasn't against the disease. It was against the temptation to let bitterness win. Movement at the back of the room caught my eye. Gavin slipped in quietly, taking a seat in the last row. He looked different, humbler somehow. The local paper had run a story about his work at the community center, helping families navigate medical crises. I hadn't read it, but Linda had mentioned it over coffee last week. Someone once told me that the best revenge is getting better. I continued, catching Ethan's smile. At the time, I thought he meant beating cancer. But now I understand he meant something else entirely. My phone buzzed in my pocket, probably another message from the board. They'd voted yesterday to make me partner, suggesting I take the position once my final round of treatment finished next month. Getting better isn't just about physical healing. It's about choosing growth over grievance, forgiveness over fury, not for others, but for ourselves. It's about recognizing that sometimes the things that break us apart are actually showing us who we really are. In the audience, Tessa wiped away tears, squeezing her husband's hand. She'd met him at one of my support group meetings, another caregiver learning to rebuild after loss. Their wedding last month had been small, perfect, and completely drama-free. Today, I'm not just celebrating being cancer-free. I'm celebrating being free from the weight of wanting revenge, from the burden of bitterness. And I'm grateful, yes, grateful, for every step of this journey, even the painful ones especially the painful ones. After the speech, during the mingling and silent auction, Gavin approached me. He looked nervous, clutching a small gift bag. You look well, he said. I am well. I noticed he wasn't wearing his wedding ring anymore. Neither was I. I, uh, I have something for you. He handed me the bag. I found it while cleaning out my mom's attic. Inside was a faded photograph from our first date, both of us laughing at some forgotten joke, full of hope and possibilities we couldn't yet imagine. I thought you might want to burn it, he said quietly. Part of your healing process, or whatever. I studied the photo, remembering that evening. We'd been so young, so certain about everything. Actually, I said, handing it back, I think you should keep it. We both need to remember who we were, to understand who we've become. He nodded, understanding flickering across his face. You really are better, aren't you? Not just the cancer, everything. We both are, I think. I glanced at Ethan, who was pretending not to watch us. Sometimes better just means different than we planned. As Gavin walked away, Ethan joined me, his hand finding mine with the easy familiarity we developed over countless treatment sessions and coffee dates. Ready to go home? He asked. Home. My new apartment, with its view of the park and its walls covered in photos of my chosen family, Tessa and her husband, Linda and Harold. 
the support group members who'd become friends, and yes, even one small picture of Ethan and me at last month's hospital fundraiser. Actually, I said, I want to make one more stop. We drove to my old house, the one Gavin had signed over to me, the one I'd finally decided to sell. The sold sign swayed gently in the evening breeze. You sure about this? Ethan asked as I walked to the sign. I pulled out a marker and wrote across the bottom. To new beginnings. Yeah, I said, stepping back to admire my handiwork. Some endings aren't really endings at all. They're just the universe's way of making room for something better. Even if better isn't what you originally wanted? I squeezed his hand, thinking of all the unexpected turns that had led me here. Especially then, 